Good morning and welcome to our live and virtual gathering of Agora Church on this uh, Lord's Day, Sunday, April 24th, 2022. Let's pray together. Lord, we bow before you now and we thank you for the love that is shed abundantly upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ, for the salvation that his love and work has brought to each of us. Thank you, Lord, that your grace is not just limited to those who have chosen to follow you, but you show grace to a world. When we look outside and we see the glory of uh, this spring weather and this spring day, we realize how you make the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. You are a God whose generosity extends beyond your people to all people. And so this day we embrace that grace. We uh, worship you and express our thanksgiving and worship to you for that grace. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our uh, new message series will be from the book of uh, Proverbs. So our uh, message passage for today is Proverbs chapter 3, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 13. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let unconditional love and truth never leave you, Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father the son he delights in. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. Good morning, church. If you would take your prepare your uh, preferred posture of worship and uh, join me as we sing this morning.
Thank you, Josh, for our uh, congregational prayer today. We've been asked uh, to pray for our brother, Chris Bardos. Um, Chris has had uh, surgery on his forearm to uh, decompress a nerve, and he's also had um, surgery on his elbow to remove some spur bone tissue and some bone fragments. And uh, so what we want to pray for him is that there would be a quick uh, recovery, if you know, uh, Chris well is a very physically active person and uh, like for anybody like that right, right when you have something like that come up it's a real setback so we want to pray for a rapid healing and we want to uh, pray as well his uh, spirit would stay strong and encouraged during this time let's pray together Lord we're so privileged to be able to come before you and bring our requests boldly before you, to take those we love like our brother Chris and to lift them up to you and to know that uh, this grace we talked of today, this grace that is shed on uh, the faithful and those who don't even know you, that that grace is uh, super abundant and available through prayer. And so by your spirit, Lord, we come to you and we ask for Chris we ask that you would uh, give him rapid healing, you would give him uh, physical comfort, that you would give him grace and patience as the, your miraculous healing and the work of his own body, the skill of the doctors all combine to then give him a better outcome. We pray for the uh, physical vitality and activity that means so much to him. Uh, we pray that that would be returned to him uh, fully and better than even before. Lord, thank you for the privilege to come to you. There are other requests that perhaps uh, people in our body have that they have not shared. And so for a moment, we pause and we lift those to you. We pray that uh, in this time, uh, those men and women who have burdens upon their heart could lift them to you. And it's in this attitude of prayer that we do. Lord, thanks for welcoming us to come before you with the things that matter to us. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for uh, peace in Europe and around the world, those places where uh, we don't often think of, but where people suffer. We pray that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, in the midst of the pandemic, one of our spiritual discovery groups uh, pivoted and began a study of the book of Proverbs. And it has, for that group at least, and for me and my participation in that group, been one of the greatest learning opportunities and for me, even growth opportunities. Uh, the fellow, uh, it's a men's spiritual discovery group. And so as uh, the guys were sharing with one another well, one by one, each of them were adding insights, and it made me appreciate again the depth and richness of uh, the book of Proverbs. Uh, if you know uh, Billy Graham, uh, the great evangelist of the 20th century, he had a habit where uh, he would read a chapter from certain books a day, and one of them was the book of Proverbs. He'd read uh, a chapter from the book of Proverbs that corresponded to the day of the month. There are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, so on the first day of the month, he'd read Proverbs 1. If it was a month that was short and ended with 28 days, uh, on March 1st, he'd go back and he would begin with chapter 1. If it was a month that had 31 days, he'd read the corresponding chapter so that every day uh, he was exposing himself to the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. Now, no one really writes Proverbs anymore. We've uh, substituted uh, 
sound bites for Proverbs. We, we've substituted gotcha for I really get it. And uh, the closest we come maybe anymore are uh, sayings drawn from the movie of uh, movies like Forrest Gump, and which some people call Gumpisms. But life is like a box of chocolates, does not compare to the call from Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. The book of Proverbs offers itself as a daily guidebook for us. It purports uh, to be an owner's manual for life and it makes some rather extravagant promises. It talks about peace and joy and prosperity and harmony in our relationships. It offers a safe and sure guidance in a very complicated and hazardous world. Jesus uh, confirmed that the book of Proverbs was scripture and he said uh, as such it represents God's mind and heart. How God views the universe. Philosophically as Christians in that age-old question that are that's often posed in uh, philosophy classes in the first year of university, the question, uh, what is reality? As Christians, we can answer that. We say, reality is the way the world is as God sees it. That's reality. Now for us then, if we want to be in tune with how the universe works, if we want to be able to flow with the grain of history and not against the grain of history, then we also have to know God's heart and mind. And one of the ways he reveals them is in the scriptures. And Jesus confirmed uh, that they are, the book of Proverbs is inspired scripture and was even a guidance for his life. King Solomon, uh, in his writings and editorial work, he served as God's secretary to uh, offer to us wisdom which is inspired. It's word for word just as if God would speak it to us. King Solomon reigned in Israel in the first half of the 9th century BC. He came from a dysfunctional family environment and never successfully built a healthy family himself. Yet as a parent he still felt compelled to reach out to one of his sons to offer him the benefit of his own life experience and study. That's why you'll see throughout the book of Proverbs uh, this phrase, my son, followed by a commandment. It was Solomon's effort to be a good dad, even though in so many other ways he failed him. Consequently, he began to collect sayings of himself and others, and he compiled them into a single scroll, a short booklet, if you will. At some point or other, he uh, sat down and penned an introduction to the collection, and this introduction comprises chapters one through nine in our present Bibles. And it's from that section that I pulled a passage today, which I think serves as a great introduction to the book of Proverbs. If you want uh, a good exposure to what the book says, sit down and just read chapters one to nine in one setting. It's, it won't take you 20 minutes. Then after that, you can read one chapter a day for the next uh, few weeks. And if you've never been exposed to the book, that's a good way to see it. You'll see that first nine chapters show that Solomon was concerned that he was equipping his son for a happy life, for a successful life, for a stable life, for a life based on righteousness. The book of Proverbs is a type of literature we call wisdom literature. It's written in Hebrew poetry, so it'll take you a while to get used to that. Now, uh, one of the most stereotypical ways that we relate to poetry in the English language. It's not all 
that's true about English poetry, but one of the first things the average person thinks of is rhyme and meter. Uh, a certain rhythm to it and then taking words that uh, sound like a previous word and that is what uh, uh, is kind of one of the foundation blocks of English poetry. That's not true for Hebrew poetry. One of the reasons is a lot of their words sound alike, a lot of their words rhyme, so every daily conversation had its own rhymes built into it and that wouldn't have been a good tool. So their artistry is shown in thought and especially in repetition. And so to make Hebrew poetry work, they use repetition and it's called parallelism where an idea is given and then it's repeated in different words or an idea is given and then the opposite of it is given. And that is how the whole book of Proverbs is put together in this poetic form, which also then serves as a tool to help you learn and memorize things. And these weren't things that you were meant to read once and forget about. They were things that were meant to stick in your ear and stick in your mind and for you to be able to practice. The type of literature we call this is wisdom literature and the key word of the book of Proverbs is wisdom. This is uh, in practical ways one of the five most important words of the Old Testament and the word for wisdom is a Hebrew word which is uh, difficult to pronounce in English, chokhmah, chokhmah. And what this word means is a lot like the English word skill. In fact, one place in the Torah, in the first five books of the Old Testament, it describes artisans who were charged with building the tabernacle and all of its uh, furnishings, the Ark of the Covenant, preparing the worship equipment of the Israelites. And it says that these men were we translate it as skilled with their hands. But the Hebrew Bible says they were wise with their hands. So the biblical concept of wisdom relates to that. It's the skill to handle something. And when we're using wisdom the way we do in the book of Problem, Proverbs, it's the, word, it's the concept of being skilled to handle life. To handle life skillfully. If you think about that, that's if you meet somebody and you're dealing with them and there's somebody who's wise, they you recognize their wisdom because they handle situations skillfully. And you say to yourself, this is a wise person. Now, all through the book of Proverbs, the message will be very clear. Wise men and women find harmony and success. Fools those who do not handle life skillfully, they find only misery and confusion. So as we introduce the book of Proverbs here, we're going to pull from this passage in chapter 3, the uh, list of five prerequisites for growing in God's wisdom. Five prerequisites we'll quickly go through here. The first of these is a balanced mindset. A balanced mindset. What do I mean by that? As human beings, we tend to go to extremes. If there's a continuum, we, want, we usually end up at one end of it or another. You know, your politics may be to the right, your politics may be to the left. You may be a right brain person, you may be a left brain person. We tend to go to these various uh, extremes of any continuum. The Bible, though, calls us, though, to a third way to trying to find that point of balance. In uh, verse 3, Solomon uses two concepts that we have trouble balancing. In fact, what's well, very interesting, uh, if you look at your message notes that we sent out, you'll see that while we're using the New International Version, we adjusted the translation because there's been a tendency 
in modern English translations to see these two words used and to say, well, they can't be used in their primary meaning. Surely they must be used in their secondary meaning. And uh, the two words are chesed and emet. Chesed and emet. They, it kind of sounds like a bluegrass uh, duo or something. Hesed and Emmett, uh, you know, will be uh, starring today at the Grand Old Opry. But Hesed and Emmett, uh, again, very important words in the Old Testament. Hesed is a word that means relationship loyalty, covenant loyalty. It, in some ways, it's uh, very much like the word agape in the New Testament, being loyal and true. Here, I translated it as unconditional love. And then the word emmet in the vast majority of its context means truth. And I'm going to suggest to you that we have trouble balancing those two words. That we have trouble applying ourselves 100% to love and 100% to truth. And you'll find we probably all have our propensity to go to one extreme to another. As Christians, we can often go over and camp on the side of love so much that we don't want to affirm uncomfortable truths. We don't want to affirm controversial truths. We want to be over there on the side of love. Or we can get over there on the side of truth so strongly that we deliver truth in an unloving way. God says that both of these things should never leave us. We should bind them around the, our neck. We should write them on the table of the heart. That if we follow God's wisdom, we can balance those concepts. We don't have to go to an extreme. We can, as Paul will later say, we can speak truth in love. We can love in word and in truth. Both of those can be true. And this third way of thinking is going to be a key to something in Proverbs. And if you have to reduce everything to binary choices where it's always either or, it can never be both and, then you're going to miss much of the value of the principles and dynamic teaching of Scripture. Because it isn't always either or. Truth isn't always simple. It can be complex, and it takes the envelope of love to deliver truth the way God would have us deliver it. So if we want to absorb the process of growing in God's wisdom, we're going to have to learn that third way type of thinking where we have a balanced mindset, where we're not binary in all that we do. There's a second uh, Prerequisite. And this is also going to cause us to stretch as human beings. And that is, we're going to have to have a dependence upon God. Uh, I know this happens to be one of my wife's uh, favorite passages, these two verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So often as human beings, we take this wonderful gift of self-determination and choice and will, and we then decide to make our paths straight. We decide kind of, if it's going to be, it's up to me. And willfully and often without a sense of dependence upon God, we set our path, we make our way. Solomon says, listen, if you want access to God's wisdom, you may have to put aside some of your own preconceptions, some of your own viewpoints. You have to put them on the shelf so that you can listen to God. You can let him take your hand to color what may be outside the lines. God's wisdom cannot be attained by human effort. God's wisdom comes through dependence upon him. It starts not with intellectual analysis. It starts from the heart with trust in him. And then in doing that, there's a step of rejection where 
we don't lean on our own understanding and we shift to him. That requires uh, the third prerequisite here, and that is a genuine humility. What did verses 7 and 8 said? Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your uh, bones. Again, in uh, the book of Proverbs, chapter 3 and verse 34, it says this of God. This is repeated several times in the New Testament. God mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, but assists the humble. I'll say it again. The reason humility is so important in reaching God's wisdom is that God resists our pride. He resists our self-determination. He resists our taking control of our own lives without his consultation and leadership. He resists that effort, but he assists those who humbly recognize their need for him. What's a third characteristic? And if you're listening carefully, you notice these are all blending. They all describe a certain approach to life in, from different angles that make a person not just wise, but in God's sense, but make them compelling when we meet them. And this uh, fourth uh, characteristic is an ability to see beyond yourself and your own needs and your own interests. What does it say, verses 9 and 10? Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. This says, honor the Lord. There are many reasons people give to philanthropy, give to the church, give to charity. But for the Christian, those reasons have to become secondary. And the primary reason has to be out of a heart that says, God is a giving heart. God, I'll be a giving person. I want to be like that. I want to reflect who he is. This is the opposite of the way we think we can fill our barns and make our vats overflow. We think that that results from holding on to anything that comes our way, where the Bible says, no, prosperity in God's economy comes from using, sharing, releasing, being a steward of what God gives us being able to see beyond ourselves and our own needs to see the needs of others. So there is uh, one gumpism in this book uh, similar to a lesson that uh, I, w I learned from my dad. And this uh, fifth prerequisite is this. A sincere teachability. We've alluded to this along the way when we talk about humility, when we talk about setting aside our own paradigms. All of those things result in us being teachable people, teachable to one another, teachable to God. Verses 11 and 12 say this. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father the son he delights in. One of my father's gumpisms, one of his sayings uh, in our family, we call them leftyisms, because that was my dad's nickname, was that he would say, Ignorance is the key to learning. With my dad, when he was trying to teach you something, how to work on a car, how to uh, learn how to use plumbing or electricity, uh, it was okay not to understand. If he says, Do you understand this? It was perfectly fine to say, I don't get it, how does it work? And he would try to explain it to you again. It was never okay to say, yeah, 
I got this when you didn't. When all that came from was uh, pride or uh, a desire to move the conversation along, it wasn't good. Here's the same thing. We have to be teachable people. We have to let God correct us. The, one of the ways we learn about God's care for us is that he says to us, whoa there, you're off track. Whoa, that's wrong thinking. Often, because it's God, we want to love him, we want to follow him. When he does that, we kind of wallow in guilt or we wallow in shame, and we don't really see how that's a necessary part of the interaction of God bringing us back on track, of shaping us. That's his act of love. What? Verse 12, the Lord straightens out, right? He disciplines those he loves. As a father, what? The children he delights in. We, if you're the kind of person that has to be right all the time, it's going to be very hard to grow in wisdom. God wants us to be people that are steerable, that can be shaped, that can be molded. Those are the, the things, if you listen carefully, wisdom here doesn't come out of intelligence. It doesn't come out of mental brain power. But instead, wisdom comes from the heart, from the attitudes we have, from being able to uh, reject the binary and choose the third way of a balanced mindset to be people that don't have to direct our own will but take God's will and be dependent upon him to be able to be humble to be able to see beyond ourselves in generosity and to be teachable people that he can correct this is our introduction to wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And as we go for several weeks here and hop around the book, I hope it'll create in you an appetite like Billy Graham has that said, hey, this is a book that I don't want to just visit once every five or ten years. This is a book I want to be part of my life regularly and constantly. Let's pray. Lord, we bow before you now and as you promise in the book of James, we ask you for wisdom. You say that anyone who comes to you and asks for wisdom, you will give it. Give us skill to handle life. Not our skill, not a skill that leads people to say how amazing, smart, intelligent we are, but a skill that says God's with him, God's with her. They walk a path that no human being can set, but that God must lead them upon. Lord, we're so glad that you're eager to take our hand. As a father does with children he cherishes, you're eager to teach us. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you to know your wisdom, to trust not on our own understanding, but instead in all our ways to acknowledge you so that you might direct our paths. Bless us, Lord, that we might handle life skillfully with your guidance. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today.